you know, I think the world tells you a lot of times that things can't be done, can't be done, can't be done. And sometimes you start believing it. And so when you're younger, you just, you haven't heard it as much. And so you're yes. like, well, I think <laughs> I love keep that. Done. just go and go and keep getting and be persistent. And, and also, you know, like people have a lot to prove and, and sometimes more to prove when they're, when they're young. And so, you know, we're really looking at how we can just gear these people up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 19 of Venturing in VC. This is a live show where we speak with the top VCs about their routines, journeys, lessons, and how they ventured into VC. You can sign up for exciting guests, live guests, every Tuesday, and also episodes are posted every Thursday on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. So I am super, super ecstatic. I'm very excited for today's guest. We've been looking forward to this conversation for a long, long time. Uh, we're privileged to welcome Ryan Holmes to the stage. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur. He started his first business in high school, ultimately opening a string of ventures. We're going to talk about a lot of those today. Um, before starting Hootsuite, though, in 2008, and now he's the founder of LOI Venture League of Innovators, which is a $20 million pre-seed fund focused on backing founders under 30. Um, and we are super excited to welcome him to the show. Ryan, how's it going? It's going great, Landon. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. Of course. I'm sorry my intros aren't as rich as J-Cal's on uh, All In. Hopefully I can get there, but I, I hope that was a decent one. <laughs> yeah, it was a very nice intro. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so, Ryan, obviously we're going to be talking about the fund. We're going to be talking about the things and qualities that you look for in founders today. But as I mentioned, we have to bring it way back um, and talk about these very interesting businesses that you have had. Um, so let's start with this paintball business that you created in high school. Have you always been a fan? Yeah, you know, I I, uh, I love paintball. I went and, uh, you know, I grew up kind of even even going a little further back. I grew up off of the grid. I My parents had this big uh, farm in the country where uh, you know, I didn't have any, uh, electricity or video games or anything like that. And, uh, um, one day I went and played paintball and, you know, really loved it. But then more importantly, I was like, Hey, I've got, I've got something here that'll finally play in my favor, uh, <laughs> which is a big piece of property. And so I convinced my parents that, um, it, it, you know, we could do it safely and it wouldn't be a risk to them or the family. And they, they let me go with it. And so, uh, I bought the paintball equipment and started the paintball field. That was, uh, the, the summer between grade 10 and 11. So I was 16 years old and, uh, was my first business, did it through high school. And what a, what a great learning experience that was. That's super exciting. I know you're not retiring anytime soon. You love what you do, but when you do retire a long, long time into the future, do you see yourself living on a farm in the future? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. You know, you kind of, I, 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 now that we've got some young kids, um, a couple of young girls, I, I think there's a lot of great lessons learned. You know, you learn on a farm, you, you learn kind of practical solutions for everything, you know, often going to the corner store or the hardware store isn't an option. So you figure out solutions and, and, um, and then, you know, just understanding the cycle of nature and all that, I think is really a beautiful thing. So, you know, my wife and I, I we talk about it. So it may, it may happen somewhere down the road. Awesome. So we're about to dive in and talk about a very interesting business that you started in your 20s. But before we do, I want to give some context. Um, looking back at your days in grad school, you attended the University of BC, um, you know, for a short time before um, launching, or I'm sorry, University of Victoria uh, before launching this interesting business. But if we were to go back uh, to those days at University of Victoria, what was a daily routine that you developed during those days that you can still say you use today? Well, you know, um, I, I did my paintball field through high school and a, and a couple of years afterwards. And then, um, you know, I knew I wanted to, to do business and get into business. So I, I went to UVic. Um, and, you know, the thing is, I was five years into doing my business. And so I, I kind of, you know, was waiting for the big aha moment, the big unload from UVic that was really going to next level me. Um, in my entrepreneurial career, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't honestly find it. I found some useful things, but I ended up dropping out of, of UVic. Um, but, you know, I would say that, that, uh, discipline is, is just like, you know, a great thing that you learn in university. You, you gotta be, you know, as opposed to high school, when your, your parents are kicking your butt out of bed, 
university, you got to kick your own butt out of bed and, and, you know, you're paying the shots for, you know, or I was paying the shots and in terms of my tuition. And so I think it just, you know, for entrepreneurs, you have to have that, that discipline. It's so important, so needed, you know, like you got to make sacrifices. Your friends are going out for drinks and party and you're working on your business a lot of the time. And that's just how it is. And, and you kind of build that muscle. It's uh, it's an important thing. Of course, I love that point on discipline. That's why it's so important to find something that interests you, something that you really enjoy doing um, and something that can have a greater impact, of course. Um, but speaking to your other point, uh, I'm like searching for the answers. I know there are so many young people, especially young entrepreneurs, um, really looking for and searching for the things that they want to pursue in life. And there's no one clear path into becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and that's something that a lot of young people struggle with. You know, They think that you have to do this certain thing in order to become a founder, um, you took a different path though. You took a different approach. So when you did drop out, you created a pizza shop. Um, mm -hmm. How did this start? And then we're going to dive in and talk about some of the skills and insights that you learned from uh, wearing multiple hats and uh, managing a pizza shop. Yeah. You know, there, there's no right answer, including dropping out. I think, I think, uh, dropping out can be glamorized as well. There's a lot of, you know, illuminary people that have been dropouts, but you know, it's a very personal decision. I never say it's the right thing for everybody, but it was the right, right decision for me. Um, you know, I think back to, to, you know, my, my, uh, my thinking on that. I, I, and, and the pizza restaurant, it's so, so funny, but you know, so many entrepreneurs, it's like, what's the thing in front of you that, that, you know, you want to go and bring to the world. I was eating a lot of pizza by the slice at university and where I grew up, there wasn't a lot of pizza by the slice. There wasn't any. And so I wanted to bring that kind of like same format, university format, pizza by the slice restaurant to where I grew up. Um, and I had passions around uh, franchising it and, and chasing it. You know, I, I, I've written a little bit on it. I called it my pepperoni MBA, which is a little cheesy, <laughs> but you know, you and intended there, uh, but, but, you know, <laughs> Uh, you, you really learn so much being a solopreneur. You're you're the operations person, the marketing person. You know, I was grating cheese. I was making pizza. I was like out stuffing brochures under car windshields. You, you do it all. And there's no excuses whether it succeeds or or fails is, is you. And um, that's an incredibly exhilarating thing. It's also scary and terrifying. But, you know, you just build that muscle. Um you know, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, I did that for two years, that restaurant. Um, and it was a good slog. Like it was, you know, it wasn't, uh, um, you know, a restaurant. I have so much respect for people that make it and are successful restaurant tours because it's a hard business. Um, but, you know, I did that for a couple of years. I learned a ton from it. And then it was 99, 2000. Uh, I always had passion around computers and the internet. And um, I kind of looked at this industry I was in. And then I looked at how, internet was blowing up and I just said to myself like I should really go and and go fish over in that pond because uh, there's a lot going on there and and you know probably even more aligned with my passions and so that's what I did sold the restaurant and then and then shifted gears and changed careers of course well thanks for talking about that slice of your life no pun intended um, mm -hmm. I do want to now dive into social media um, and kind of the innovation that you've seen in the field when you know since starting before yeah. we do, though, I want to bring up one interesting quote um, that you tweeted a while back. Um, and I think this is really going to be powerful for people my age tuning in um, that want to learn more about your journey. Um, you tweeted that you're not your first job, but you are the sum of what people are. You're the sum of what your past jobs have taught you. Um, looking at the culmination of all of the different jobs that you've had, um, maybe even before stepping into this field of social media um, and focusing there, I'm curious of some um, insights and traits that you've learned from the random but exciting jobs that you've had. Yeah, well, you know, maybe th that's a great lead into the next chapter. Maybe I'll just talk about the next chapter because it really yeah. gave me a lot of, uh, and this is kind of pre Hootsuite, post pizza and pre Hootsuite. So I, I basically self taught on on HTML, CSS. I, I just got a big computer and I hold myself up in a apartment in Vancouver and just learn, learn, learn and just bid built portfolio and did everything I could. Um, and then I started building websites for people and building web. 
Um, I started an agency in 2000. It was a services agency called Invoke, which you know still is around in Vancouver today. And um, we just did lots of different projects. And it ended up being a hybrid of a product company and a service company. And you know, I'd say to your listeners out there, this is a really cool way to learn about what people's needs are, how people bringing you a lot of problems that need solving. And then our typical model was we would um, you know, build out solutions for people, web solutions, digital solutions for people, and we would earmark the rights to resell the solution. And so we had, you know, from the from the run up to Hootsuite from 2000, 2008, we built out probably about 10 different software products. Uh, we marketed them, promoted them, um, engineered them and really got, you know, our 10,000 hours, uh, you know, our Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours of mm -hmm. rep in as a, as you know a leader but also as a team of people that were building products um and we just continued to get better and better and better at doing that and you know that ultimately led us to you know the aha moment for hootsuite we were um doing social media as a service for our customers that wanted you know promotion exposure on social media and uh we we built the product to help our team do that and that was kind of the you know the aha moment for that and, um, you know, I, I tell entrepreneurs, you know, what I, the difference between my agency work and the pizza restaurant work uh, was just getting in front of a big wave. You know, restaurants and, and pizza, I guess, are kind of a mature industry, mm -hmm. but there's so many uh, industries, including today, that are, are new industries. And getting into those new industries, you can be an expert in two years. But, you know, if you go get into, you know, traditional banking, it's going to take you 50 years to become the expert in your firm, right? It's going to yep. take you a long time to become a real estate expert. But if you want to go be a crypto expert or if you want to become a DeFi expert, you can be an expert in two years and you'll have as much expertise as, as most people in the, in the industry, right? So I always tell young entrepreneurs, go and find that, that wave and get in the front of that wave because it's really where you want to be, where you can build your expertise, where you can build credibility. And, um, you know, the chances are you're going to get swept along with that wave. I'm smiling because I love that you brought that up. It's a perfect alley to my next question um, because social media, it's so clear now. I mean, networking and it's not going anywhere. I mean, we see all these large companies that have really built, you know, just I mean, lasting impact and how many jobs social media has created and social networking. But when you started in the field back in 2000, you know, it was still emerging. I mean, it hadn't really proven itself yet. Yeah. Um, so I equate that, as you just mentioned, to a lot of these emerging in industries today where a lot of people are kind of laughing about they don't take them fully seriously Web3, I mean, there are so many others. I'm curious though, when looking at something that's moving fast, but it's also super new, um, like social media for you back in 2000, what resources did you use to get on get in front of that wave and learn more about it? And then we'll even talk about um, current entrepreneurs and founders today looking um, through the same lens at Web3 blockchain. How can they get in front of that wave? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, you mentioned um, your passion alignment and, and, you know, when you are learning something that you are just so passionate about that you find so cool, that's when you get into flow state, right? You just, the hours become, you know, go by like minutes and you're just so deep in it and you're just drinking from the fire hose and it's easy, right? Like that's, that's really what, what we're all should be aspiring to and aspiring mm -hmm. for. And so, you know, I, I challenge people just to keep like, being curious, exploring, finding the things that they think are interesting and just doubling down on those things. And ultimately, you know, you'll get rewards out of that. Um, and, you know, I think I was around for Web 1, which is 99, 2000, kind of the advent of, of consumer internet, around for Web 2, which was the convergence of social media, mobile, uh, you know, 2005, 8, mm -hmm. kind of era. And then now Web 3. And I would say that um, you know, every every one of those eras was super exciting. But when I when I look at the opportunity in, in this kind of Web3 era, um, I think there is, this is the most exciting of those three eras, honestly. Like I just look at how much disruption there is, how much opportunity. And yeah, you know, like in, in 99, 2000, people were talking about like getting pet food delivered at, on pets.com, which, you know, ultimately dot bombed and everybody thought it was all over. And um 
you know, people were laughing at Twitter in, in, you know, 2008. They're like, you know, another social network. I don't care about this. It's, it's irrelevant. It's going to be gone tomorrow. Uh, and so there's always these haters that, that, um, you know, don't get it, or it's easy just to sit back and comment and sure. you know, make jokes of it. But, but, you know, there are going to be tons of businesses, to, you know, disrupted by web three and, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we put technology back in the box. It's always falling forward. We're always learning and evolving from this. So I think it's a very strong bet to, to make a big, uh, you know, a big uh, commitment and investment in this area. Yeah. I mean, what Chris Dixon write about um, a decade ago that like, you know, some of the most powerful technology, technology start looking as toys, um, yeah. things that can be easily dismissed and people can laugh about, but um, you know, sure. There will be a lot of uh, maybe crypto projects that, do not become the Amazons of tomorrow and, you know, really large um, and end up having impact. But there are so many companies being built now just scratching the surface that will um, support so many people and have a lasting impact. So I think that's really important to note. Um, so I'd love to now zero in on Hootsuite a little bit, a company that you built from nothing into something, something really large that has helped mm -hmm. and delivered value to so, so many customers, um, users across the world. Um, I would love to learn about how during those early days did you pitch Hootsuite um, and kind of connect that to the advice that you give founders today when it comes to pitching an idea. Yeah, you know, it's a, uh, wow, you know, that's a journey. So, you know, where I, I would probably shudder thinking about how I pitched it back in the day and, and uh, you know, get get all cringy, but, you know, it's, it's getting 10,000 hours of reps in, right? Like on mm -hmm. anything. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I can encourage everybody, like, don't overthink it. It's better to pitch than to pitch, you know, even poorly than to not pitch at all, right? But, well, but um, you know, I, I think uh, I look back to the deck, I look at the opportunity that we saw and, and um, you know, we knew that that we were onto something. We launched it out of my agency, as I mentioned, as, as a beta project. Um, and product that our team used, we were kind of were dog fooding. So, you know, if, if you can find opportunities that either your customers have or problems that you have, that's, that's where it all starts. And then from there, we just continued to evolve it and evolve it, got a lot of customer feedback. Um, there was a lot of virality in our product. Um, there was a, you know, on Twitter at the time, there was a sent via tag that got applied to every message and people could just start seeing that, that, you know, it yep. was via Hootsuite, sent via Hootsuite. And, and a lot of people um, really, you know, started switching clients and, and tools because of that. Um, so, you know, one thing that on that note, like looking at virality of product, how you do customer acquisition, this is something that I always really, um, you know, dial in on and, and, and unpack with, with founders. How are they going to acquire customers? What's their cost to acquire customers free or otherwise? Um, and what's the value of the customer? So, you know, how much are they going to earn off that customer over their lifetime? And these are these are like really important levers that everybody needs to be thinking about. Um, you know, whether whether you're going to monetize them today, tomorrow, whatever. You know, I always look for a real simple, high level financial model. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't include that because it just gets you know like there be dragons. It's just like a complicated thing they don't want to have to deal with. But like put together some assumptions even because mm -hmm. I love to see how entrepreneurs think about it. Like you know, it should be a a table with like four rows of like here's our cost to acquire a customer, here's our revenue, here's today six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. And, and like, let's just have a conversation on how you're thinking about the monetization opportunity. Um, you know, we put in monetization opportunities in our early deck. And um, interestingly, we went and explored all of them and found, you know, the right ones that worked for us and our business. Um, you know, we've got over 20 million users around the world now on Hootsuite and, and um, you know, some of the biggest brands on the planet. And so, uh, you know, we managed to just continue to evolve and grow and, and uh, help solve the, the pain of our customers there. It's really remarkable what you and your team have built, Ryan. Um, so I no shame to Gen Z, but I do want to share something that, you know, a lot of my peers want things tomorrow. You know, they want to build a unicorn in less than a week. They want things very soon. For you, this was a 12 plus because it's continuing your journey, you know, from founder, mm -hmm. CEO, board member, um, continuing to help support and, you know, um, see what's going on at Hootsuite. I'd love to talk about how your roles have changed, you know, through um, this journey for you. So, you know, mm -hmm. starting as one person team, you know, like really trying to pitch this and then, you know, slowly growing to now supporting and having, you know, multiple um, thousands of employees um, across the world. Um, because I really want to dive into 
just the support that you guys are giving founders today and like letting them know that this isn't just a short term journey. This is something that you're going to have to carry on for a long time um, and continue to really have eyes on this. So well, let's yeah. talk about how your position has changed and evolved at Hootsuite. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, first off, I'd say uh, kudos to founders that want to go build that unicorn faster than ever. And I'd say it's possible, right? Like there's a lot of elements that exist today that didn't exist, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. Um, you know, the ability to, to just like pull an off the rack e-com system or off the rack payment system with, you know, block or other other tools um, that that does speed up your development cycles in such a huge way. And so mm -hmm. you'll get it right. Like all the founders out there like, yeah, you, you should be you should be aiming for that. Um, you know, I'd say that just to talking a little bit about my journey. Yeah. It, you know, Hootsuite came out of my agency. Uh, we had a three person team working on it. Um, we started to see this amazing, you know, growth of users and, and, um, then we spun it out. So one year, basically from inception, six months later, I was fundraising and a year later we closed the fundraising. Um, and so we had, you know, venture capital to go and start to build and really accelerate the business. Um, you know, leading the, leading the business as CEO for 12 years, an incredible journey. Uh, we went from three people to 30 to, to 80 to, uh 150 300 500 800 uh 1000 and we sit at about 1300 today so some pretty big uh, chunky years of growth there um you know at a high level you know as a, as a founder and leader uh, of of a high growth business um you you know i'll say some things that sound like i think pretty obvious but i'll say them anyways your mm -hmm. role changes from from being more roll up your sleeve operationally involved to more strategic and mm -hmm. and leading through people um the amount of communication that you do increases in, is significantly so you spend a lot more time communicating than doing and um you know luckily like those founders that that build a build a unicorn in a year and have a thousand employees in a you know a short order that's like you're you're really learning fast uh, in order to be able to scale with that um you know I, we we went pretty fast to to 500 800 employees i think it was over a four year period but um you're you are just you have to be open to growing and learning and um working through people and so you know growing and building that team i'd say that um you know, a thing that I would really focus on next time around is those, that like early team that you have, they're such special people, especially if they come in like pre-funding and they're just like working on the product and, and working, you know, in, in different facets of it, because those people are like the real, they're kind of the cult members. They're like the real believer because early days, you usually don't have a lot of capital. They're not like the top paid jobs. You're giving them equity. They're kind of believers in this future imaginary thing that you're doing. <laughs> Um, but they're, they're like the real believers and, and later on it changes to people that you're giving them more compensation, less equity and, and the, uh, future of the business is more defined. And so, yeah, you know, I think those are that early team really cherish those people, um, really try to keep them along on the journey and, and try to help them grow and evolve their roles. And, uh, it's always going to be, you're going to be bringing new people on executive bench and others that are going to be helping you scale to the next level. Um, but try to keep a combination of, of your, you know, team that's been there the, the, with the domain expertise and then new people that are bringing new skills and, and abilities to the company. Of course, that's probably why it's so important to be very clear when communicating the mission and vision of the company to those early employees, because that's not just only going to help you receive more funding uh, from potential investors, but also, I mean, that's going to be a reason why people want to use the product and also more importantly, maybe work for the product or service that you're trying to build. So I think that's uh, really important. Uh, so Ryan, now I'd love to, and I'm really excited for this uh, portion of the interview, I'd love to now talk about League of Innovators. Um, this is again, the pre-seed fund that you have created, $20 million fund um, focused on, and this is the most interesting part to me, uh, supporting and backing founders under 30. Um, this means a lot to me because I have another podcast where I specifically interview people about what they did in their 20s. I understand how difficult it is to be dealing with a lot of uncertainty and be dealing with the world around us while trying to be a founder and entrepreneur in um, you know your 20s. And of course, you know this is something that you've experienced yourself, but I want to hear from you. What made you focus on this uh, very specific um, decade? 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question. A little bit of it's my personal story. You know, I, I started my first business when I was 16 and Hootsuite at, at 35. So really a 20 year gap there. And, um, you know, I'm just such a big believer in in, you know, the innovation that founders create, the prosperity that happens for the founders, for their team, for the community, for society. Um, and so if we can, you know, create more innovation like this and, and accelerate this innovation, I think it benefits everybody. And so that's really, you know, the kind of core thesis around League of Innovators. I started it as a charity over five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we've helped, um, you know, be part of uh uh, uh, over you know eight hundred million dollars, almost a billion dollars in in enterprise value creation over that period of time. So some amazing young entrepreneurs were, you know, just so happy and excited for them and to be a part of their their journey and their story. Um, so we provide them with you know programming content, educational content. We provide them with mentorship and networking, and you know as we looked at 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 um, you know the the value that's been created. It just made so much sense to create a venture fund that helps accelerate their fundraising, um, and and that's what we announced in December 21. Um, and the response has been fantastic. We're I think over 80 percent closed on the fund, and um, in in that short amount of time, we've we've had uh, so many checks that we've written all like double, triple up. We've had one that's six x the you know the the. Wow. Um, the fund so we're the, the fund is doing amazing out of the gates uh and we think we're really adding a lot and helping a lot with the entrepreneurs so um it's it's for me it's so exciting to be able to to ha you know do something with purpose but also that i think it's going to be really a, a great area for investment that's super exciting uh so ryan you've obviously had your finger on the pulse of many industries uh kind of the first user of a lot of these really really amazing sectors that would take off um and create so much value again jobs Etc. Um, I'd love to, you know, dive deeper into the fund and hear some of the industries that you're most interested in investing in right now. Because I'm understanding that it's been 90 days since launching. You guys have made around nine investments so far. So congratulations. Um, but yeah, let's learn more about the portfolio. Um, what are some of the founders in your portfolio building right now? Well, um, we've got, you know, we're, we made about nine investments. Um, we're we're vertical agnostic. We have we brought in a bunch of uh, LPs that are. Um, domain experts, you know, my, my I've got my areas of core competency and expertise. My my founding partner as well has great areas of competence, but you know you can't cover everything. And so we've got some really great LPs that that we tap on if if um, there's a, a startup that is you know in their wheelhouse and and get them to opt in to see if they want to help out. Um, we've got uh, LPs, uh, you know, in in CPG. We've got um, LPs in SAS. We've got LP you know, all over the board. Um, the couple of couple of companies that you have know, note. Um, one that that uh, strikes a chord with me is is Spontively. Um, they're doing something really interesting that has a lot of parallels with what we did with Hootsuite. But basically, they're helping um, community managers. As you you probably are aware, just there's so many companies that start are starting with community first these days. Um, you know, I'm an investor in Soul Savvy. And the Soul Savvy, they've got uh, you know a sneakerhead community. That's that's how they started with sneakerheads, and then they've built out now to actually provide the ability to to get exclusive access sneakers through this community. Um, so it's it's a very common theme, um, and Spontively is helping community managers to build out and and track ROI on community. And so, you know, this is a, has a huge analogy with what we were doing with Hootsuite, you know, social media managers managing social, mm -hmm. community managers managing community. Um, their, their growth is just off the chain. Um, love the founders and, and uh, we think it's a really great business. It's, um, you know, we're, we're optimistic on, on the future. We think they're, they're definitely touching on the right um, areas of the business. And, you know, personally, I'm helping them, you know, with a lot of uh, insight and experience from how, how they're going to market things that we would have done earlier, sooner, differently, and, and uh, hopefully helping them accelerate what they're doing uh, in their business. Um, 
And, and, you know, I mentioned we're vertical agnostic. We've got, you know, another business that's um, uh, reusables. They're, they're creating a, a, a business around reusable uh, food containers, uh, drink and food containers. So it's an interesting business, has a lot of CSR elements. Uh, we're excited about that. Um, but, you know, the big thing is just, just for us, um, not being too hung up on, on verticality. We've got some Web3 investments that we love. Um, our, our primary um, kind of one of our gating items is that the businesses, you know, we're, the, the fund is, is primarily Canadian based. We're doing 90% of our investments are Canadian uh, businesses that come through the charity. And we've got kind of about, about a 10% opportunistic um, inbound discretionary investment. But um, we love businesses that are headquartered in Canada, um, but mm -hmm. then our, their go to market is in the US. So they're, they're going and you know, earning US dollars because right out of the gates, you get a, a 30% uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, bonus. And, and so that really helps if you keep your cost centers in, the, in a lower cost uh, market and, and drive uh, you know, those US revenues. So a couple of things that, you know, that we're looking for there. So we're going to talk about the Canadian um, tech ecosystem um, because I'm very curious myself about that. I would love to enlighten our um, audience and those listening um, about what's being built there. But before we do, just uh, one more question about the portfolio, uh, specifically about the founders that you guys look for um, and you know the maybe traits and skills that you're looking specifically in founders. I know we hear the conviction, you know, we hear the domain expertise, but you again have had such a unique journey uh, to you know building a company, becoming a serial entrepreneur. Um, and ultimately now investing professionally um, with League of Innovators. So what are some specific traits that you look for um, and your team look for in founders? Yeah, well, you know, I think one of the things that uh, you know, we have belief on, uh, you know, is around our age thesis. Um, when I go and talk at, you know, to groups like, you know, YPO or EO, I always like to do a straw poll on, on the age of the entrepreneurs in the audience when they started their first business. And it's amazing the number of entrepreneurs that started their first business when they were in their teens. Um, and, and so I look at that and, and I think um, it's kind of this like secret sauce that we have that nobody is, is, is really thinking enough about mm -hmm. and this early indication. And um, so if I, if I take those, you know, those young entrepreneurs, those early entrepreneurs, and we think we like add 20 years of experience into them, I think we're, we have an ability to get a lot more successful outcomes a lot more quickly. Um, and so, so that's, you know, obviously a, a big part of our thesis, um, that youth, that energy. Um, you know, I like when, when um, you know, I think the world tells you a lot of times that things can't be done, can't be done, can't be done. And sometimes you start believing it. And so when you're younger, you just, you haven't heard it as much. And so you're yes. like, well, I I think keep it. Done. I just go and go and keep getting and be persistent. And, and also, you know, like people have a lot to prove and, and sometimes more to prove when they're, when they're young. And so, you know, we're really looking at how we can just gear these people up and, and get them going. Um, and then, yes, we're looking for all of the typical traits. Like, I think we focus a little bit less on domain expertise uh, because mm -hmm. we think we can help apply that in and get get domain experts that help in. And, and sometimes we we don't want a jaded view on an industry, um, but we want that, that hustle, that tenacity, um, you know, the ability to get up and, and have grit and resilience um, because it just doesn't always go your way. Um, you know, intellectual curiosity. Um, are you curious? Is this person curious about what's going on in the world? Like, and do they really understand the vertical that they're in or want to get into? Because that's going to be so important if they know that business cold. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, ability to work for a team, lead a team. Um, these are all kind of, you know, common, uh, table stakes for, I think, you know, anybody looking at, uh, investing in someone. I love that, Ryan. Yeah. VCs need to offer a lot more than just money. You need to be able to help founders get to that next step, give them the support that they need. So it's clear that you guys have so many unique value adds um, towards this very interesting demographic of founders. So really, really love what you guys are building. So now I want to briefly talk about Canada um, because, you know, everybody's talking about Miami. I feel like everybody's talking about Silicon Valley. Everybody's yeah. talking about these places. Um, Austin. Uh, yeah, Austin. But yeah. Canada does not get the attention it deserves um, along with many other wonderful tech 
in startup ecosystems, having built such a strong Canadian-based company um, and now supporting strong Canadian-based founders um, for the 90%, as you mentioned, with that League of Innovators. Talk to us about what people, what are common misconceptions about Canadian uh, startups and founders? Well, you know, I, I think that, uh, look, Silicon Valley is an amazing place uh, to, to network, um, to build a business. Um, it, it, there's there's incredibly smart people that have been attracted to Silicon Valley, um, and um, you know I, I think that that said uh, there's there's no way that any one geography, one city, one area has a monopoly on innovation and and good ideas, right? So mm -hmm. you know I just with that in mind, um, you know I I think less about Canada and just more as the rest of the world. Like, you know, there can be startup uh, centers and, and innovation centers kind of anywhere globally. I think that um, COVID remote work has really changed um, totally. uh, you know, a lot of the world. And, and all of a sudden, I think, um, you know, venture is looking further afield. And I, I think it can happen anywhere, like innovation centers and, and good innovation can happen anywhere. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a bit of a, a thematic decentralization of the valley uh, mm -hmm. that's going on. And you, you know, mentioned Austin, you mentioned um, Miami, uh, but, you know, Waterloo, Toronto, Vancouver, mm -hmm. you know, on and on. There's amazing, you know, good startups happening wherever. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think about uh, the domain expertise that's happening, you know, with Web3, uh, Dapper's headquartered in Vancouver. There's an, a lot of alumni that are coming out of there, people that get it and understand it. And um, that, that creates just kind of a virtuous cycle of innovation. And so, um, you know, we're looking at alumni of Shop if Shopify in, in, you know, Toronto, Waterloo. Uh, that's spurring a whole, you know, e-com revolution there. Um, and so it just kind of goes on. So I don't think anywhere has necessarily, uh, you know, stranglehold on on innovation. And then I'd also say there's a lot of good programs. There's the, you know, the the economic uh, again, foreign exchange uh, discount that we talked about and a lot of amazing programs like Shred and IRAP uh, that are innovation programs that help uh, Canadian companies to, to do innovation and give them some funding and, and um, tax breaks in order to do that. And I think those are really incredible programs uh, in order to do. And I think they're helping Canada build like a, you know, an incredible innovation economy. I love that. Well, I will say that the overlooked places like Vancouver, Chicago, where I'm calling from, we're going to continue to have to, you know, keep proving people wrong. Um, yeah. And it's just really powerful what you're building at League of Innovators because you will be funding, you know, the next multiple Hootsuites and like future companies that really, you know, are not just impactful wow. to, Can to Canadians, but also to, again, a global level. So really powerful what you guys are building. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's very awesome. exciting. We love it. Yeah. So, Ryan, I'd love to close out with a fun segment that we do on Venturing in VC called Five Minute Favorites. Um, this, unlike the um, other portion of the interviews, is a speed round. So you don't have to think too much of the uh, answers you give, but this is just going to help listeners get a better understanding of, uh, of course, what's going on up here. So uh, if you're ready, we can start with the first question. Oh, man, I, I did not know this was coming. I'm, I'm like pre-coffee. but All right, we'll do of it. Of course. So how about this? We'll give you three passes. We give three passes to every single guest uh, just to be all respectful. Right. But the questions are fun, and um, again, don't think too much of them. <laughs> but uh, what's your favorite book? Uh, it is uh, probably Neuromancer. Okay, love that. Um, favorite company? So this can be a company that you, I know this is a mean question, it could be a company within your portfolio that you're extra excited about, or just yeah. a general company or product that you use often, but what's your favorite company? Oh man, well you know, uh, Hootsuite's my baby, so I gotta, I gotta say Hootsuite. Uh, I love that. Just, you know, so much love for, for that brand and business. Um, you know, company I'm not involved with. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think I, I think it's a it's a controversial one, but I, you know, I love SpaceX. Um, mm, it's yeah. it's I think Elon's done an incredible thing with um, putting so much awareness, you know, on on the stars and creating like a mini space race. And um, you know, I I'm I think uh, you know that's that's humanity's future is maybe getting off this rock. I'm a I'm a Star Trek fan, so <laughs> we got to do something with that. I love that answer. Um, favorite podcast, and you cannot say this one. No, I'm kidding, but favorite <laughs> podcast. <laughs> uh, present company excluded. Um, I, I, I like uh, uh, Bankless, and I like Tim Ferriss. Awesome. Um, favorite song? 
band or artist? Um, oh man, uh, you know, I was just at a robot heart event in New York this weekend and, um, uh, had listened to, uh, acid Paul and beast fence and, uh, and had a great, uh, great time with them. Awesome. Um, by the way, I know favorites are really hard to pick because we can have multiple favorites, but you're doing a great job. Uh, favorite <laughs> food. <laughs> oh, pizza. Okay. Oh yeah. Done. Um, favorite TV show. This would be a show you used to binge show that oh, I'm man. really watching. Yeah. You know, it, <laughs> I got I got so many, but um, uh, I'd say uh, you know Game of Thrones when it was in heyday. Mm -hmm. um, been digging Vikings, and then and then because we've got little girls right now, I just need something like really vanilla sometimes to play in the background, and that's that's um, The Office. It's just like kind of oh, well, that's a great show for everybody. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty, pretty good. We've all. Um, been yeah, we'll do the final two. Um, you can take a little more time to think about these ones, but favorite childhood memory? Uh, favorite childhood memory, uh, I used to have motorbikes on the farm and so probably going for motorbike rides with my dad. Awesome. Uh, last question, favorite piece of advice? This can be a piece of advice that you've gotten once in your life that you've held on to ever since or a piece of advice that you give to uh, you support people you work with, but favorite piece of advice? Um, you know, I'll, I'll paraphrase a, a quote, but it, it's something about, you know, in your, in your 20s, uh, you're thinking about what everybody else is thinking. In your 40s, uh, you don't care. And yeah. in your 70s, you realize nobody was even thinking about you at all. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, I think that's a really good one. It's like we get caught up and we think everybody's like, you know, kind of examining us, whatever. But everybody's just actually in their own head thinking about their own shit. And so, you know, like just, just take risks and, and go do your thing and don't, don't worry about it. And like, we all make mistakes and we just recover from it and, and iterate and move on. Um, I think it's a real good one and, and something that for young, young entrepreneurs, young people, you know, I was there, I was always thinking, you know, somebody's watching, oh, I'm going to get judged, whatever else. You just got to get past that. I love that. You got to put the blinders on. Uh, Ryan, I just want to say this means the world to me that you were able to join the show. Um, this was such a wonderful conversation about your journey, the support you're currently giving the founders, um, and the impact uh, that League of Innovators will continue to have. So just thank you so much. My pleasure, Landon. It was really fun. And uh, keep up the great work yourself. Thank you.